Bruchem Aboyim. Uh, thank you for coming, and um, this class will be the last class, uh, the only class I've really done three classes on so far because of the difficulty of the subject, pain. And in the last two dis- meetings that we had, we've discussed different types of pain, uh, pushing yourself beyond your comfort zone to achieve more. Also pain caused by sickness and loss. Um, but I thought tonight that I deal with a special type of pain, the pain that's connected to thoughts and past experiences. Um, life's not a reality. Life is perception. It is what you think it is. Uh, there are people who lose a limb and they still feel that limb. The greatest torture a person can have is mental torture. So it's really something for us to examine a bit and see if we can undress it, if you will, and get to know it a little bit better, and maybe deal with it better. When we daven every day and we say the prayer in Hashiva Shavtenu Kwarishna, return the judges as before, we ask God to hosser me menu yogomba on the to remove from me all negative thoughts, all complaining. Why? Because we're connected to God. And he deals with us with chesed, with kindness, and with mercy, and with righteousness. And then, only then, does he deal with us with mishpat, with judgment. The Holy Baal Shem Tev tells us that a person who has fear dies many deaths. A person who believes in God only dies once. So it's not the actuality that really destroys us, hurts us. It's the fear that we have of what things are going to be, which many times are even worse than that itself. There is a Hasidic saying that says, think good and it'll be good. Put your head in a good place. You have a choice. You actually have a choice of what you think about. But on the other hand, negative thoughts come into our minds. So what are you supposed to do with that? And my question really to you is, if you have a negative thought in your mind, why entertain it? It would be like a person, an unwanted guest that came into your house, that maybe you can't keep out, and maybe you can't even throw out. You can try to throw him out, maybe he doesn't go. But you don't have to be nice to him. You don't have to serve him food. You don't have to give him a bed to stay in. You can ignore him. You can treat him as if he doesn't exist. Who says that you need to make him feel welcomed? So too negative past experiences. You know, anything that's in your past is behind you. And anything behind you, you've already passed up. The only way something behind you catches you is if you slow down. Keep moving. Again, you don't need to let him in. You've already passed that, and it's not necessary to deal with it. Now, on the other hand, the anything in the past, really, those negative things are not what you need for the future, except... So, you know, psychiatrists, it seems like people make a big deal about going over people's past, bringing it back. Why? So I'm not going to say that it doesn't have a purpose. We know that in Pirkei Avos chapter 2, when the five illustrious students, Rabbi Yochanan and Zakkai, are asked to give their rabbi the greatest traits in the world that a person should have, that one trait, Rabbi Shimon says, Roa es anolet which we translate to me, know the consequences of your action. A chess game. Be three moves ahead. Know what's going to happen. Anticipate things. But the problem is the word nolet is past. So what he's really saying is look into the past so you'll have some idea what the future will bring. So in reality, that, that makes sense. Use the past as a teaching tool. That experience should help us So, if you put your hand in the fire the first time, you don't know. It burns you. Why would you put it into the fire the second time? So it's using the past experience in a positive way. 
But whatever you've gone through in the past, when it comes to haunt you in the present or the future, why let it in? And if it comes in, why keep it there? Why make it comfortable for it to stay? Why, for any better word, enjoy it as much as you hate it? There was a great movie, Beautiful Mind, a true story about a Nobel Prize winner who had mental problems. He saw things. He saw people. And by the end of the movie, what he did is he did not destroy his demons. These people still existed. He just didn't talk to them. And when someone would come up to speak with him, he would first make sure that that person was real, not in a fictitious part of his mind. He would ask someone else, do you see this person? And if they said yes, he would talk to them. But if they would have said no, he's not going to deal with it. Who says you have to? So what we see is basically you need to bring other people into the equation. Who says that you need to carry the load alone? The beauty of what we have in Judaism is that you do not stand alone. That you are part of Klal Yisrael. What the Jews accepted on Mount Sinai was this concept of what we call a ravis. Of culpability. That we're all one body connected to each other. When someone has, uh, when your toe hurts and someone asks you how you're doing, you don't say, I'm feeling terrific. My toe, bad news. If your toe hurts, you hurt. If you get a paper cut, your whole day focused on a paper cut that didn't bleed. Everything you do hits the paper cut. We are one body. If you're having a problem, you need to have a friend. You need to have family. You need to get someone to talk to. And just talking about it, just letting it out, when it stays in the recesses of your, of your heart, of your mind, it's like a vampire. And that vampire feeds on darkness. Once it reaches the, the brightness of light, when you talk about it, it already gets better. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying that a person let's say even panic attacks. They're real. But there's something generally that triggers a panic attack. A person needs to analyze what it is and then deal with that. Try not to put yourself in those situations. And then know, as horrific as it is, it's going to end because it always does. And whatever works, whatever that is, as long as it works for you to make it less or to take up less time, you know, you're not going to solve all problems by completely wiping them out. But what you can do is make them less, each little bit less. And each little bit less is a success and something that you should look at yourself with pride about. And by taking that little success, one day you turn around and it's a big success, but always success. And you don't beat yourself up. You always see it as a positive. It wasn't as bad as it was the last time. The reason why we suffer so much is because we choose to suffer. God does not want us to suffer. He wants us to get better. And again, there's a positive to each one of it. Now, what I want to do is end. Even though we're dealing with pain, how do we deal with someone else's pain? So with everything I've said, do we go to someone and we see him in pain and we say, and we look at him and we think, great, I'm glad he's in pain. Pain is successful. Pain will help them to be better. If it doesn't kill you, it'll make you stronger. All of that. Good thing you're having an operation. Good thing, God forbid, that someone passed on whatever. How do we look at it? So the Torah tells us. The Torah tells us when these two brothers, Yosef and Binyamin, met after 22 years of not seeing each other. The Torah says there that each one fell on each other's shoulders and cried. And Rashi there tells us, commentary, what were they crying about? So Yosef was crying about the fact that his brother Binyamin, the two temples that were, made, that were built in his territory, would be destroyed. And Binyamin was crying about the fact that the Mishkan of Shilda, which stood for 369 years, in the portion of Ephraim, who was the son of Yosef, would be destroyed. So they each were crying about each other's pain. So the commentaries ask, why didn't they cry about their own pain? Why were they crying about someone else's? 
And the commentaries tell us because when God puts pain in a person's life, it somehow, some way, whether we understand it or whether we don't, has a positive objective to it, a positive result, even though we may not see it. But it is positive, and one needs to believe that. But not for someone else. When you see someone else in pain, you need to cry. He needs to be strong. He needs to be resolute. He needs to think about Gamzu Latova. This is for the best. That if God has put this in my way, there's a reason for it. If, if it's a mountain, it's a mountain I can climb. If it's a river, it's a river I can cross. If it's a desert, it's a desert I can handle. There's nothing I can't do. If God has given it to me, it means I can do it. But it's tough. And it doesn't mean that someone else looking at it has to rejoice. He can ask God to, to make it a little easier and pray for you and hope for you and find some way to make your journey easier because after the journey's over with that's what we are that's what makes up who and what we are the successes of those difficult times nobody talks about the everyday successes that they have they talk about the difficult times the times that were the toughest the poorest the most painful the most difficult and they say them with joy why feel the joy afterwards? Why not know that when you finish this, as you're going through it, that the end result will be that you'll be joyful, but not someone else. He needs to commiserate with you. If I can give you a reason for the Holocaust, that doesn't mean you don't cry. Tears are important. They're important to enjoy, and they're important for someone else to see that you care enough that it makes his life better. And it makes his life better. Just to know that someone else cares. There's nothing lonelier. There's nothing more painful than to stand there all by yourself. And when you do, God forbid, stand there and you have this empty feeling of no one cares. No. Just like the poem with the man walking in the, in, on the beach. And he looks back into the, into the sand and he sees one set of footprints. And he calls out to God Almighty and he says, You said that you would be with me all the time. And there's only one set of footprints. And God says to him, My dear child, those print, footprints are mine. I'm carrying you all the time. And that's what we need to know. We are never alone. Never. And the more alone you feel, the more God is with you. So that's what we need to connect to. And when we connect to that, pain is pain. But we can turn it into pleasure by virtue of the fact of the successes that we have. May God help us all to see other people's travails with deep emotion. You know, I once told a friend of mine something that was very a deep pain to me. And I can't tell you how much better I felt and I was amazed as tears were coming down his face I couldn't cry he was crying and his tears were my tears and it made my burden so much easier may God bless you all that you don't feel pain but the truth of the matter is no pain, no gain so not that I wish it on you but hopefully we learn how to handle it in a way that makes all of our lives more positive to get us to that final place, that final end which is the world to come, where all those inconveniences, all those problems, all those tears, all those pains turn into joy. It gives us an everlasting joy in the world of eternity. God bless and have a good Shabbos.